Hello. Hi there. It's so nice to see people not in a Zoom box. People are taller than I thought. People are smiling more. So it's lovely to actually see you guys all in person. Um, my name is Pretty Lakani. I am SM13, graduated from Rick Segris program. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here today to kick off our first alumni weekend in person, in person program since 2019. It is a big deal. Yeah. I'm super excited about this 24 hours because it is a professional shot in the arm that I think we could all use right now. Um, <clears throat> I will spare you from my dance and singing skills, but I just want you to keep this in mind. Ice, ice, baby. And the reason I say that is because we have three goals in this next 24 hours. It is to inspire, connect, and educate. Inspire, connect, and educate. <clears throat> and I just wanted to take a minute and tell you how that happened for me approximately nine years ago at my first reunion. Um, I did not take his class, but I, I had the good fortune to sit in on a gun violence prevention lecture by David Hemingway, who's a professor there. And I bought his book. Um, and it's by my bed and I read it when I need inspiration. And so I'm going to borrow shamelessly from his book. And I'm going to start off with a literature reference, and then I'm going to end with a literature reference. <clears throat> and this is, this is in the beginning of his book, and it is from the ambulance in the valley. And this is the last section of the poem. Better guide well the young then reclaim them when old. For the voice of true wisdom is calling. To rescue the fallen is good, but tis best to prevent other people from falling. Better close up the source of temptation and crime than deliver from dungeon or a galley. Better put a strong fence around the top of the cliff than an ambulance down in the valley. So we all have a lot of professional stories about the pandemic, but I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the moral injury, the, the personal cost that we've all sustained, each and every one of us in the room. So just, I'm going to ask you to just take five seconds and take a look around and just take a deep breath because we are all here together and we're all alive and we've made it. And there's a lot of us that didn't. And um, the lovely thing about this is the reason that we're all here and alive is because of the good work of all the people in this room, specifically our lecture tonight. And I am going to, um, I have the good fortune of introducing um, Dr. Corbett and Trish and Ponch, and they are going to, Dr. Corbett will be speaking, and then uh, Trish and will lead us in a question answer session. And Trish and stepped in at the last moment. Um, there's been a lot of shifts in planning this weekend, as you can well imagine. And uh, our resiliency and flexibility has been, you're going to see it showcased here. Um, and I'm going to end with this. This is without telling you which book it's from. I think you will all be able to guess. This is the last literary uh, reference. I keep picturing all these little kids playing some game in this big field. Thousands of little kids and nobody's around. Nobody big, I mean, except me. And I'm standing on the edge of some crazy cliff. What I have to do is I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, if they're running and they don't look where they're going, I have to come out from somewhere and catch them. That's all I do all day. I'll just be the catcher in the rye and all. I know it's crazy, but that's the only thing I'd really like to be. So with that, Dr. Corbett and Dr. Panch, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, cool. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you for coming from all the 
different bits of the country and for some of you the world uh, that you've come from. Um, I appreciate uh, many of you, including our esteemed guests, have been sprinting to the finish line of this week in order to make it here. And we appreciate the kind of craft in doing that and appreciate any sacrifices you've made um, in order to be here. Um, I'm Trisha and I'm president of the Alumni Association. Uh, I'm incredibly excited about this panel. Um, we're going to make it somewhat informal. We have a few questions that we've discussed before um, uh, to kind of go into some of Dr. Corbett's work, but then also some of her amazing leadership and personality behind it, which I think a lot of you will be familiar with already. If not, you definitely should be. And if not still, you definitely will be after this. Um, so we're going to um, take about half an hour to do that. And then we'll have half an hour or so for your questions. So. Um, there will definitely be time, so if anything comes up that, from what we've said, or um, uh, you'll, you'll have time to ask it, and we'll have a roving mic, and we can, we can ask you for those things. Okay, so, Dr. Corbett, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, okay, so for anyone here who's been living under a rock, uh, um, or has been living under the, you know, in, in a state of shock with all of the things that have been going on in the world in the last few years, and therefore is not aware, of the work that you're doing. Would you mind just telling us a little bit about what it is that you do now and what you've been up to more specifically in the last few years? So, so generally I have to follow um, an introduction that's basically reading what is all about me on the internet. And she said nothing, <laughs> <laughs> which is good because um, what that means is I can just tell you all of the really great things. Um, so I'm, I'm Kismikia Corbett and I got to the Chan School, um, a year ago now. Um, I'm in the, um, IID department where I, I have a lab and I focus on coronaviruses and previously, um, in my previous life, I was at the National Institutes of Health, uh, where I, um, worked on coronaviruses. I'm a viral immunologist, so I studied vaccine development and, um, in part led the vaccine development for Moderna's COVID vaccine. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be starting a lab at Chan, um, and to be expanding upon, um, all the things that I love about coronaviruses, but, but really, um, taking a step back and thinking a lot about, um, endemicity, um, what that really means, what that really means from, you know, training the immune system and, and how, um, we can think about next generation vaccines, um, given, everything that's happening right now with SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. And I'm also very happy to be here, so. Excellent, thank you. I mean, on, on behalf of everyone, welcome. Um, there's a number of different themes that you, that you brought up there that I'd like to um, explore a bit. But I mean, I think one to bring out, um, to start off with is uh, one thing Dean Williams, who's, who's with us today, has uh, put a lot of emphasis on recently is that we, um, doing the science is great, um, communicating the science is e arguably e equally important in terms of realizing some of the change that that science can offer. And a lot of your work is also in that area, right? Not just doing the scientific work that you described, but also A, more broadly communicating it, and B, uh, with a specific purpose of trying to make sure that the distribution of those gains is as well thought of as the absolute level um, right. they're in. So I, I always like to preface these types of questions by saying that my scholarship is not in science communication, although it would be nice. Um, <laughs> I just don't, <laughs> I don't have the bandwidth for it. Um, so when, when people say that my work is there, it really is like my heart more yeah. so. Um, that is there. What I found in the pandemic is that um, we were not getting our point across, even though we were, I, I, you know, we published like what, like nine science nature cell papers in a year or something like that, even though we were obviously very much getting the science across. And we had this effective vaccine that was very clearly safe, but people had no idea what was going on behind the walls of that laboratory. No one could explain it to them. And um, sadly for me, even more so because I'd been working on these types of things for so long, I felt bad because I felt like I hadn't done what I was supposed to do mm. as a human 
to inform people about my science for the past six years. And so I kind of just had to step back. I actually like asked um, the NIH communications office if I could, once we got to a point where it's pretty, we were pretty sure that we were going to have an approved vaccine. If I could just step back and like go on tour, even like, can I get a tour bus and like knock on doors and tell people about the data and the science? Because it is absolutely so important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we have definitely come into a time where more and more so-called basic scientists, even though I'm not so sure I like that term anymore, um, are using their voice in that way um, and taking the science to the streets, as I like to say. Um, but we have a long way to go. We, we ha I think my disclaimer in the beginning is one of the places where I'd like, I'd like to see that there is some um, inclusion of science communication and the scholarship so, you know, in the same way that diversity efforts were, have been included in the scholarship. So like no one can ignore it because like people publish DEI papers in science and sell now. Um, I'd like to see science communication be that way so that we, we kind of have to take up stock in that area and everyone um, understands that it is just a part of the job. Excellent. So, I mean, this kind of, I guess almost this kind of new science of health communication to like extend this, um, uh, is something I'd like to discuss um, here because um, it's clearly a large growth area for the school where there is kind of this fledgling expertise and a lot of re refactoring work that's been done recently. And I think we'd all agree it's super exciting, right? Like given the huge number of socially important problems where we have people at the school working on them, if we could tie that with uh, the craft and the platform to get those messages out so the impact can be realized. it's. Um, Hugely important. If you wouldn't mind, before we go there, though, if we could go to, um, I guess, the kind of communication issue. So, you know, the words really matter, right? And and one of the things that I've seen that you brought up previously is uh, rather than vaccine hesitancy, um, you know, amongst people who are who are skeptical um, of the vaccine in the public, the term um, of vaccine inquisitiveness, which I think is a very very powerful reframing of this issue so I mean would you mind just telling us a little bit why you, what the thinking behind that is so um I so I have to be very frank um <laughs> in that the thinking of that comes from the fact that I had a, an incarcerated cousin who called me a lot during the pandemic still calls me a lot um but um he's no longer in jail um and I was going to be talking to um, maybe New York Department of Corrections or something. They had me zooming into their, their prisoners and I was just kind of basically asking him a lot of questions about what's going on in there. What are people feeling about the vaccine? And, you know, and I was like, I just don't understand why, like, you know, you're so hesitant. It's like, you're, you know, you're in this box and you're around these people all the time. Why wouldn't you want to be as protected as you can be against this virus that at one point, you know, in prison, people were some of the most in danger yeah. um, for severe illness and then unfortunately death. And he said, I mean, it's not that we are hesitant. We just have questions. And it just helped me to kind of reframe. I mean, obviously outside of the, the imprisoned people, but for many people, it was just these people, there are certain populations that do not have the opportunity for me to zoom in and ask me or anyone for that matter, um, very pointed questions about what is going on. <laughs> you know, what is this technology? Why did it, how did it happen so fast? Should I get my child vaccinated? Should I get the booster these are very relevant questions that anyone who has an inkling of care about their health and what goes into their body should be asking. The difference is that we are in positions where we can call our physicians and ask, or I mean, like you're here. So most of you have, you could have my email and contact me or, in, or you have the knowledge yourself, but most people do not. And so I felt that as defensive as he got <laughs> given the type of person that he is, if he cared that much that I called him vaccine hesitant, mm. then imagine what just like normal everyday 
people um, how they felt when, yeah. we, when we turned it that way. And so I just felt like we needed to make sure that we gave people a clear end to asking us the questions that they had. But it's a very important reframing, right? Because you're like, it's kind of inherently humanizing. It right? also like puts the onus on the person who has to answer the question. I agree. Which is quite frankly, all of the onus of the whole pandemic is on like us. Yeah. So. But equally kind of implicit in that is that um, this kind of issue of systemic mistrust or mistrust of the system, sorry, maybe is more accurate yeah. a way of putting it. That obviously is deeply ingrained. Yeah. Um, which, which is, you know, even um, in many communities, had I not been available to zoom in, which is why I did it so yeah. much, um, they wouldn't have called anyone. Yeah. Because there was really no one else that even looked like they could be trusted to talk about the vaccine, which is sad because, well, one day I want to not be able, <laughs> I want to sit back and like <laughs> not have to, um, you know, do so much work. And so I would hope that these trust issues would start to go away and, you know, we could start to, as a, as a, a scientific community, as a whole, we all embody what is trust to everybody, no matter how you look. Um, and, and, I, and I, I, I don't know really where that starts, although I've had conversations with people who um, sit in very high places, like presidents and okay. um, directors of National Institutes of Health and governors. And I honestly think that one of the places where it starts is that we have like yet to apologize for being not trustworthy. Um, and maybe it's not us in particular, but at some point, we're going to have to address what is the elephant in the room in that people who look like me, people who you know have my title as doctor and who have my title as scientist or what have you, or nurse, did people who look like you completely wrong at one point and continue to do that. And I am so very sorry. And what can I do to help you and your community to um, get past the point you know, and I, I don't think anyone's ever said that. Um, Truth and reconciliation. Yeah, I don't think anyone's really ever said that. Is the assertion that without that, fundamentally, like progress is not possible, is kind of cosmetic? I, um, I mean, you know, uh, you know, apologies have to come from a very genuine place. Yeah. So the, I, I, I want the people to be in those positions that are genuine about it to, to, to start. Yeah. Um, but um, I think that one of the things that's going to help the progress is the conversation continuum. And I've been very, actually very disappointed in myself, quite frankly, in that I actually haven't been able to keep up the momentum of the conversation because like starting a lab is a job. A real one, like a real job. Um, but I think that, you know, we're going to have to not ignore people for 10 years and then wait for, I don't know, MERS or yeah, yeah. NEPA or whatever other pathogen X to come and then start the conversation again. Um, even today, I was, I did something with the Washington Post. Um, I think at lunch, they do these like live Twitter, whatever's on at lunch. And um, it kept asking me about the COVID vaccine and the booster. And I, I kept trying to reframe it as, as like a bundled package because like we're, we're, we completely missed the mark by targeting each of these vaccines or each of these pathogens as one rather than as a continuum of education around um, preventative health and vaccines in general. For example, this is going to be a shit show for lack of a better term um, of a flu season. and. People don't even know that they can get their COVID vaccine and flu vaccine at the same time. Um, so these are just very small things that we just have to keep communicating to people. Um, and I, I just, 
I don't know. <laughs> no, no, sure. I mean, I mean, these aren't kind of things that yeah. lend themselves to kind of a tweetable answer, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Is um okay. So, so would you mind if we kind of shift a little bit? I mean, I guess kind of go backwards. So, you know, you mentioned about health communication. Thought very interesting phrase. It was like my kind of human obligation to do this. Um, I'm really interested in that. Like, why that word rather than professional? Um. So, I mean. The NIH most certainly does, did not pay me for my science communication. In fact, they hated it. <laughs> for most of the things that I said went against um, some of the rules. <laughs> but um, because I, I, I'm very vocal about people, um, I, I'm very vocal about the things that I care about. And so I, I care about um, communities of color. I care about um, poor people. And I most certainly from a seat of what is uh, seemed to be a seat of power, right? Where I was developing this vaccine, I get to call Dr. Fauci and say, like brief him and like all of these things. I most certainly was not going to be quiet about it. Yeah. Um, and it was, I forgot what your question was at this point, but, but, I, but I think that, but, but the one thing that came from that, that I learned was that, um we the 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 way that science has been kind of given this face of um you know like everything's okay until it's not okay, okay. and and that's why i i that's a lot that's a lot i think of why people don't necessarily trust science or trust data because they they'll say well you know like things like suddenly changed. And I'm like, well, actually we've known this terrible thing, whether it be, you know, this thing causes high blood pressure, I don't know. But for, for a very long time, nothing really changed. It just boils to a point where now we're all of a sudden speaking about it. And now all of a sudden there is a mass of scientists and science communicators who care about a particular subject. So, so just to, yes. So you said you forgot the question, but you didn't. I mean, like we were talking about why the use of the word uh, human rather than professional. Yeah. Like, w w what is that motivation? Yeah, I think you know, it's very adequate. So when you've put it beautifully. I actually um, one of the reasons why I really enjoy being an academic is I don't feel like anything is a professional obligation. I should say that with like my dean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I literally like. I don't know. I know there are things that you have to do to get tenure, but like, <laughs> but like for me, I I literally feel like part of the beauty of being an academic is that you get to wake up and do whatever calls you in your particular yeah. expertise on that on that given day, and in a time where at one point about ten x black and brown people were dying from COVID. And um, I think in some of the earlier surveys, when we were talking about the vaccine rolling out, only about 30% of those people were even thinking about getting the vaccine. That was thinking about getting the yeah. vaccine. I felt like, you know, my purpose completely shifted. Um, and it just so happened that it, it bundled <laughs> um nicely into the package with what was the science that I was doing but you know I can't promise that I won't be vocal about like world hunger tomorrow if that's what I wake up and care about like yeah I mean look I, I have to say in a kind of slight departure from the agenda just honestly I'm just so pleased you're here like <laughs> it's um and it really is just so clear like how important representation is um for these issues to be addressed because you're right none of them are new they uh, similar what we saw with covid tracks pretty much every other health yeah. outcome and track social structure right there's nothing we haven't discovered anything obviously on the science side we right have, but yeah, yeah. But, but, it, but but main picture we, yeah. we really have um and you know I, I also the fact that we have from a big picture standpoint haven't discovered much of anything new but the fact that that big picture hasn't been translated down um, feels like we're continue even to do um, a disservice to, to, to certain groups of people. Yeah. Okay. Could we, um, where are we time-wise? Oh, 
Okay, we are at that point. Um, so, so I've got um, just one one question before we before we invite you all, um, uh, and it's kind of a little bit more tactical. So, you know, you mentioned about uh, the communication kind of toolkit and how that wasn't part of your academic training necessarily, but it arguably is a large part of the translation of your academic work into impact. Do you kind of see that this is going to be more of a mainstream part of the education of future academics, um, the kind of strategic initiatives of schools of public health or other healthcare organizations like ours? I most certainly would hope so. Okay. I, I, I really, you know, and, and, you know, every, everyone should not be forced into this space where, you know, you say you want to be a public health practitioner, so you need to understand how to talk to the public because there are people who, you know, can write great policy, but don't need to say a word or, you know, everyone kind of has their lane. But I think that for the people who really do care, a lot of people who interview with me are more mostly interested in me. I'd say about half and half interested in my science, but then also interested in like, can I teach them to speak? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, can, how do you, you know, what are you doing about that? Um, and so I do think that, that there should be some formalization of the processes by which we, we train people. Um, I, I know that, for example, Chan has like a Friday morning class that's right now like communicating to the public or something like that. Um, so we're, we're making strides, but um, we certainly have a, a long way to go. I, I mean, there have been things that I've learned in the past, even now, I still do some media hits, um, um, but I, there have been things that I've learned and I'm just like, wow, had I learned this earlier, it, it would have been make my communication to other scientists better. Cool. So it's just important. A lot of potential in this area, right? A lot of potential. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Can we um, invite someone to raise their hand and, oh, okay. Brian? Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> I thought it was going to be here. You raised the sample. Um, I got you right after this. Um, so thank you so much for talking about that. And I really love the aspect that you talked about that. Kind of a humility to hear other folks and you were talking about your cousin. And I know for me, when going through the pandemic, I felt like I learned everything about how to communicate just by being in a barber shop and hearing how people were talking about it. So what lessons would you give scientists, which I think often sometimes can be in that Eiffel Tower approach, to have that humble inquiry to go and see how people are talking about the work, um, kind of real talk in to some degree? You know, um, I don't. whenever you said barbershop, there's actually a I don't remember the name of the nonprofit, but there's a, a everyone's shaking their head. So someone knows. Okay. So you probably know too, that there's this like barbershop nonprofit that goes around and, and talks about health issues. Anyway, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what, um, I, I don't know if you can teach that kind of um, human approach really, but you know, one of the things that I, jokingly said back when people were I was I really cared about coronaviruses and people would like leave the the our departmental meeting whenever I would talk about coronaviruses because like it wasn't flu it wasn't HIV um and I remember when uh Zika was a thing and Zika wasn't really getting much attention from a congressional finance standpoint until it was shown that um, Zika infection shrunk testicles, and then the money poured in. And I remember, <laughs> I remember saying, coronaviruses are going to have to make, and uh, you know, hopefully this isn't offending anyone, but it's going to have to make white men sick. I remember saying that, and um, that's when it became humbling, right? When it came to every everyone's front door. Um, and really, you know, the president of the United States was hospitalized with with COVID. So it, it got to a point where it was like, you know, anyone's game here. Um, and I think that the only way, because I don't wish illness or bad on anyone, right? But the only way to humble us all is to make sure that we are not, that the 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 tower 
is not filled with the same type of person. So that everyone that you're around every single day is not exactly like you, um, even for me, right? It's not exactly like me, isn't, you know, this Harvard trained or XYZ trained MD, PhD, isn't this science cell nature published. I actually have, I, I have a diversity scorecard for the people that I hire in my lab and it goes beyond ethnicity. It even goes to like the types of journals that they publish in. Because I think that people who have a very strong amount of publications in like journal virology actually know probably a little bit more virology than even I do, right? Because this is how it goes. Um, and so I think that we just have to shift the atmosphere a little bit. Um, and that's really the only way that you're going to start to see wow, like, you know, my student just went through that. That's just like, I, I never even thought that someone could go through that or my colleague just experienced this or that. Um, experiencing through other people. Thank you. Um, I believe there was- I think, yeah. I think. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you for giving me the chance to talk to her. Yes, yeah, so I have a question. Like in the history of public health, we go years, Public health education is one of the most important part of the overall public health activities. Communication, as you mentioned, is a modern name for the same public health education, right? The public health education, what I see, when I was in high school 50 years ago, uh, they used to, I was in a, in a far east small community, poor country at that time, and that was called East Pakistan, now it's Bangladesh. So what I saw, the immunization people, they used to go house to house to vaccinate cholera, to vaccinate typhoid at that time, right? So health education is a part of public health from the long time. But what we see in the United States, uh, we don't have a national commitment. So mm -hmm. if this time, when the people die, like until 1982, when Rock Hudson died, AIDS was not an issue. When Rock Hudson died, that became an issue and people putting money for AIDS research, right? Now we have a lot of progress. But same thing, COVID, people are dying. Then some got involved, we got money, we got everything. Finally, we got some cure as well as prevention. So how you make it a permanent thing from state, federal government, to the local board of health. So that every UA, in the school we go, school education. You know, school, school we can teach kids. We kiss, we kid, uh, sorry, we kid, we teach kids now about the sexual diseases, ST, STD. So why we don't make a plan, a national plan, say from federal government, from the Dr. Fauci or CDC or NIH, to the local board of health, state can make a plan in permanent, anything comes, not the uh, COVID vaccine, you know? Now the new things coming. Now the, what called the monkey virus is coming, right? <laughs> so how we do make a national commitment that this is the one thing we do we use communication tools. We have millions of communication tools, which we don't have yet. One commercial, in any local TV or a national TV or a web, what do you call, a, anyway, you know, we can give information to the people. So we need some commitment and funding. What we can do about that? Oh, gosh. Um, he's, as I'm stressed out about a grant that's turning in, he's asking me what to do about funding. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, this is this is a very, um, even now, right, with, with the millions, billions probably even, uh, dollars that are, are going into COVID research, <laughs> I feel like, like even, it, it's like a, a, a dollar too late. And also like now we're ignoring all of these other viruses that we get this kind of financial drain into one area and also brain drain. All the students wanna work on COVID um, now. And so, you know, I don't know 
other than we are going to, the same way that we talk about, you know, educating the general public, I think that we do have to start to educate politicians, but like early in their political career. Like not when your city, city councilman is now in the Senate, but when they're your city councilman. Um, it's kind of like we talk about, you know, pulling in STEM, kids into STEM, you know, in elementary school. I think it's the same way because once you've gotten to the point that you are now running for Senate or, you know, U.S. representative, you already have your political agenda. And there's really not much that a scientist can say to you to change your mind about funding and when we're talking the type of funding that is necessary to package these public health issues is billions of dollars right when we're talking about that kind of funding there's really nothing that i can say to you at that point point. and so i've been pretty intentional about making sure that i stay in uh political spheres even though i don't necessarily like it but making sure that people who run for local offices, have the ability to contact me, and that I um, have good enough rapport to that I can contact them as well, because I think that it's the same kind of conversation that has to remain open. Um, the other thing, too, is that we also liked to think about money from a federal perspective, and that's great. I mean, like, this country is rich, but there are people who are rich, 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 like individuals. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think a lot about foundations that are started by the uber rich and what they could be doing if they were guided um, in, in the right directions. And of course, you know, like Gates and all these foundations do a, a miraculous job with, with the tools that they have. But there are some places where they fall short that could really... Um, uh, use someone saying that you don't always have to focus on what is almost like the sexy science, right? Um, but the things that aren't necessarily in the headlines all the times are also very important, particularly when we're talking about prevention of disease. Excellent. Could we have someone from this side just to kind of make it fair and maybe towards the back? Oh. Hi, that was a really ooh, loud. Um, that was like a really good talk. So kind of building on what you just asked one thing. So my field of study was health management and uh, within the health uh, policy and management department, but then I also studied a lot of infectious disease epidemiology. And I think that one thing, um, like within our own country, because like this is the perspective that I can speak from, I feel like very often one of the issues was that, especially because like, you know, we have checks and balances and bureaucracy and this and that, that um, sometimes the government, I don't know how to describe it, but if it was paddling in one direction, and then science is trying to paddle in the other. I feel like that's so hard to overcome. How do you feel that like as scientists can kind of work around that where it's like, let's suppose, you know, the government isn't funding certain, like tons of research for certain diseases. Cause like what you said, it's not like the sexier one at the moment. How do you recommend working around that? Like if there's just so many forces not working against you, but at least not working with you, like what do you recommend for that? I recommend that, um, academic development offices do their job, right? It, I mean, having to rely so heavily on federal funding really shifts the way that you think about the types of the work that you do, um, the type of stuff that is important um, to you starts to be framed based on what is the agenda of the National Institutes of Health or what is the agenda of, you know, HHS um, overall. Um, and so, you know, to have more free thought, we just have to have more free funds. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know what the, the, the real solution to that is, um, but I do know that there are some things that are coming on board. Um, for example, there is a, ah, it's pretty, I'm forgetting the name, but it's, it's, like, it's almost like a, a BC fund, but it's for academics that really like just, you like go pitch something as if it's a company, but it's like your science and they give you like a boofy amount of money, um, right? So like these kind of things that are, allow us to do science very differently. The other thing too, is that, you know, I, we, we are going to have to continue to remind the scientists and public health practitioners that we train 
that their voice is really important and that their voice matters because it's outside of finances, it is also just like sticking up for what you believe in, right? So if the politics is going in one direction, but the science is very clearly going in another direction, then the scientists should be screaming from mountaintops about that um, in such a way that it makes the, polit the politicians and the politics so uncomfortable that they almost have no choice but to listen. And that happens um, a little bit in this pandemic, but I mean, like, I, for one, was ready to risk. I, I would have lost my job. I don't, I didn't care. So like, you have to be like, have a stance that is very much like the voice that I have and what I have to say is more important than anything that you could take away from me, um, which is, um, you got to teach that probably from like, you know, grade school, but it is something that scientists have to be, be more strict about. I think that's called leadership. Yeah. Um, Okay, could we have, I guess, okay, well, I guess that's decided. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adelina. Thank you so much for being here tonight um, and for your work in science and beyond. So my question is about um, public-private sector partnership from a policy perspective. So whenever there is any effort to negotiate or regulate drug pricing, what we hear from pharma companies is that it stifles innovation. Um, they spend so much money on R&D, but as we know, the government spends a lot on vaccine R&D as well. So I would really love to hear about your experience um, working at NIH with Moderna, and then if and when a handoff happens uh, along the process of vaccine development, and if you have any thoughts on drug pricing that you'd like to share. <laughs> um, so so one, uh, I should... I won't comment on the, the drug pricing thing um, and all, but what I will say is that one of the reasons why I chose vaccines um, as I was thinking about, you know, work in a translational space is that vaccines tend to be a more cost-effective way. Um, and so, and also as much money as vaccine companies are making off of the COVID vaccine, Trust me, Pfizer is making a lot more <laughs> off of uh, the other things in their portfolio. So it's not as lucrative as other things. So on a scale, um, working at the government and working with uh, an array of companies, it wasn't just Moderna, there's plenty of them. Um, it actually isn't as, wasn't, I should say, now it's a little bit more complicated. Um, at that point, it was not as complicated as one might think because particularly for Moderna, right? When I was working with Moderna, you know, seven years ago, Moderna didn't even have an immunologist, right? Like, so it was the way that the most productive collaborations work is that there is a breadth of expertise and you're able to feed off of each other. And so it became a pretty, um, like the relationship was easy in that way. Um, and I think that the one thing that, um, in academia, it's a little bit different. I'm learning with working with companies, but, but with the government, the one thing that the government does not necessarily need from companies is money. And so I think that that pulls away some of the curtain between the interactions and allows for there to kind of be this relationship where, there is an exchange of information, right? The government doesn't necessarily want anything from the company, you know, but, and the company wants like the government to work in the way that the government works. So it, 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 it works out. Um, I, it can get sloppy at times, I think, but I do not, I wouldn't want a situation where companies were wholly in charge of the R&D especially for things like vaccines, because um, number one, we probably wouldn't have a COVID vaccine. We probably wouldn't also have COVID antibodies. So it took someone from the government to say to these companies, like this is important enough that we study it and that we work together to do it, right? Um, and companies kind of have a different view. And so I think that these types of relationships exist because of that mostly. Thanks, Adelina. Um, maybe um, we haven't had anyone from that kind of area, so um, 
I just you don't want mind. her to like run around. Huh? I want her to <laughs> run around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get some steps in. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, it, it, as, assuming someone's got a question over there. If not, then no problem. I know. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're, we're back here then. So enough to it's in the past. I think I got Sorry. the microphone. So I got a question. All right. <laughs> Thanks for that talk. It's really great. Um, you know, we have the discovery and the evidence and we have the vaccine confidence work and the strategies to help change frontline behavior. It seems like we have a really unique issue, especially here in, in the US with the political will and the fact that the pandemic, the virus and the vaccine became political issues rather than health issues. And I guess I'm interested in your comment on whether there's any chance that we can pull that back out or whether we're going to be stuck there be because we are often looked at as a model for public health decision making and right now CDC is really at, at the bottom of that rather than helping that. So I, as I told um, the Washington Post interviewer today, I do not think that we are in a position to pull out of what is now the political slant of the vaccine, the pandemic, other things, monkeypox, whatever it may be. And I personally, given the political divide, and I mean, it, I think it's gonna get worse. And so I think that we are going to have to prepare better. Um, for that. And I, I don't really know what that necessarily looks like, but what I do know is that we're going to have to um, adjust the way that even we uh, tend to, you know, be one side or the other um, and become more neutral in the way that we speak. I think it is a lesson in communication. I think it is a uh, by far a lesson in acceptance. So I, I, I remember, you know, at one point there were people who I respect who just kind of gave up on, you know, Southern Republicans around getting the vaccine. It was like, you know, we got, you know, 65% of the country is vaccinated. Okay, whatever. And, and we cannot have that view um, moving forward because it's, it's only, it's only going to get worse. And so the other thing too, is that vaccines are kind of like the tip of the iceberg, but the chunk of what plagues these often polarized communities um, is, are things that play, you know, impoverished people or undereducated people. And I think it is our duty in public health to be neutral because the problem is so deep. And, um, you know, it, it's the vaccine. I, I think it was sad to watch. I think that, you know, we had a, we had a president in the beginning of the pandemic that was pretty vocal. And so it made it look like this might be like the first time, but if you step outside of some of these things, I mean, like the HIV epidemic, pandemic um, was also pretty politicized as well, even down to the way that the trials were conducted. So um, historically, it's always been like that. And I feel like it's probably just going to get worse. And so we have to shift our mindset from this side and prepare better, maybe train differently, train different people even. <laughs> My, in the same way that we think about going to reach into middle schools and grabbing up, you know, black and brown kids to bring them to STEM, we might need to be going into the South and bringing some Republicans into STEM too. I, I, I really, no, seriously, I'm from Hillsborough, North Carolina, okay? The KKK marches down my main street annually. So I'm allowed to say this. I really do think that we need to go into the South and train different minds and, and start to really like broaden a way that we, we think about science being for everyone, really, and being a scientist being for everyone. Okay, on the subject of being for everyone, we can choose one person <laughs> um, uh, for the last question. So it's between the two of you. I'm not sure. Are you sure? 
Okay, it's this lady here. Thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, you need me. Two days ago, flu Moderna booster. Oh, oh yeah. My mighty women mouth is. Some was, B cell biologists might would have wanted you to get them in the same arm. Okay, <laughs> I, was I, was born, I was born and raised in Mississippi, and I think people are right about politics because I'm old enough to remember polio vaccine. People trusted in science, and the only thing we wanted is the white people weren't going to keep us from getting it. But there was nobody white or black didn't think it was good because we knew people who had the effects of polio. Fast forward to my you know, graduating from a Chan school and then going 10 years, Boston Board of Health. And you're noticing people start thinking that government is evil and that we, why are you doing this? And we said, nobody goes into public health because we don't like people. Mm. So th they just put all of these kind of weird mindsets that they think you have. And why are you telling me I need a shot? I thought, what happened between then and now when we were in Mississippi, poorest state the union, lowest, educational level believe that you should get a polio shot and some of the other infectious disease vaccines. In fact, Mississippi has some of the strongest mandatory vaccine laws on the books, except for this one. Not even religious exemption, you know, in the Bible mm -hmm. belt. So, so can you just comment on yeah. just what happened in the political climate? Because I'm concerned because I don't know why and how that happened. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess that makes it for an easy last question, but I, I, I honestly don't know. But what I will say outside of the politics of it is what I think that happened in public health is that public health did too good of a job. And so once things started to work, right, vaccines are working, um, some of the public health infrastructure, even though we have a lot of criticisms about you know, the HIV pandemic, quite frankly, some of the public health infrastructure that was built off of that, the way that community health centers are run, the, you know, increasing in community health centers, all of these things, some of these things are really started to work. And so when people aren't seeing very upfront um, the disease at, diseases at their front door in the same way, they start to ignore the fact that these things are necessary. Um, and, and I think that's, I think that's part of what it is. Thank you for the question. Um, thank you all. Um, and I guess we are basically bang on time. Okay. Is, um, I think that's a lot more than design, but um, yeah. Okay. So, so, so we have a reception coming, but before we get there, um, I think it's a phenomenal way to start off alumni weekend. And I feel privileged to have a front row seat um, to this. So I think I'd like you all to join me in thanking Thank you. Thank you.